Okay. All right. Good morning. Now, this is where we left off um, last Thursday. And um, any any questions uh, right off the bat? Anybody have any questions about the material or anything? Uh, as you recall, what we're looking for is detection of coronary artery disease is one of the primary things that we're looking for. And detection, it comes in two, two uh, uh, strains. One is looking directly at the vessel to see that there's a stenosis or a clog in, in the artery. <clears throat> and another would be to look at the muscle downstream from that artery and to determine if there's a perfusion deficit or a functional deficit. And these were the list of imaging tests that are done uh, in cardiology and radiology uh, to try and discover the existence of significant coronary artery disease with the uh, relative sensitivity and specificity. And rem recall what I said last time, these are generous estimates. They're sort of estimates made usually by people who, you know, uh, like the particular technique that they're testing. And so when you test these things in a very objective way, oftentimes you get different results for sensitivity and specificity, which we'll see uh, in an example shortly. So <clears throat> once you've detected the disease, can you do anything about it? One of the things that can be done is you can place a stent, it's a, called a coronary stent, and it's like a tube, a metallic tube, that you place inside the vessel and you expand that tube such that it has pressure against the vessel walls and it holds the vessel open. So if the vessel is closed down to a very narrow opening and blood can't get through, you insert this device, which is on a guide wire, you push it through the section of vessel that has the stenosis and you inflate this balloon and around the balloon is this uh, stent. And it's made of metal. And, um, you know, a couple of million of these are done a year. And uh, it's, it's sort of transformed what happens when you go to the ER with chest pain if they find that you have a significant coronary stenosis that so they can just open it up right away. Right? And the, here's a cartoon of how it works. So here's the significant stenosis in the vessel. Um, and so they were down to, you know, maybe 10% or something of the area of the primary vessel. Uh, you get across that stenosis with your guide wire. You line up where that device is with respect to the stenosis using markers on the, on the guide wire and on the device itself. And then you inflate a balloon and, and the stent opens up. And then what you're left with after you've inflated is this uh, scaffolding inside the vessel. And ideally, you endothelialize that scaffolding and the whole thing just creates a nice smooth new round or cylindrical vessel. Uh, there's a couple of, you know, uh, risks associated with this. One is you could uh, perforate the vessel with the guide wire uh, this whole device, you pull out all of your equipment and everything can re uh very quickly. That used to happen more often when these were bare metal stents. Now they're actually coated with uh, a particular material that makes them uh, uh, not prone to, to form and clot. So here's an example of an x-ray angiogram. This is, we're looking essentially uh, from the top of the patient through their chest this way. Uh, this is the spine. This is the catheter, diagnostic catheter coming into the coronary artery and injecting dye into the artery. And this is the right coronary artery. Remember you have two major coronary arteries coming off your aorta. And uh, you, you run along the course of this artery and you can see that it's not a regular diameter. It's kind of messy. And so that's the first sign that there's disease. And then there's a section that really dims away uh, quite significantly. And so there just isn't much dye through here. So that's 
considered a very significant lesion, probably greater than a 90% reduction in diameter. These days what's done is called FFR, we'll take a look at that. You look at the pressure here, proximal to the lesion, and, and the pressure distal, and see what the pressure drop is across the lesion to see if it's significant. Uh, and then after the stent is placed, it looks nice and wide open, right? So it's hard when you look at these pictures, for me anyway, if, if this was a picture of my coronary vessel, it's hard not to want the picture on the right, right? Because it's wide open, you feel like, oh, okay, things are back to normal here. I can get on my bike and ride and whatnot. It's, it's been shown interestingly, so... Common sense would say this is the right thing to do, open that vessel. But when you try and run a clinical trial where you open half the vessels and then the other half, you just give them the best meds that you have possibly, the survival increase of the, the folks with the vessel on the right that's been opened isn't that significant. And uh, it's a conundrum, right? You say, whoa. You know, why, what's with that? Um, the symptom relief, when you talk to physicians and patients, is something that they uh, indicate is, is a major benefit of this therapy. And that is you stop having pain and you, and you can then ride your bike and things like that. But then they did a, a study recently of symptom relief and it didn't seem that the symptom relief was much greater on the right either. So... But that study was only 400 people or something, and it wasn't that huge. But it's it, they, this whole field and, and the imaging that leads up to it to decide, do we do this in this patient? Do we put a stent in this patient? That, a lot of what cardiac imaging is about is deciding whether you do this. Um, and then the whole field took a, a, you know, a deep breath when this trial called COURAGE it's an acronym came out and showed that there wasn't a survival benefit. So if somebody wanted to review the COURAGE trial and related trials afterwards, uh, that would be a good, good thing to look at, um, just in terms of practical outcomes of imaging. The other uh, mode of therapy to revascularize the heart is uh, putting a um, coronary artery bypass graft in or cabbage. Say. And in, in this surgery, normally what happens is you do a sternotomy and you, you crack the patient's chest and you open up their rib cage and you expose the anterior surface of the heart. So you're looking at the heart. And then the surgeon will dissect out the left interior mammary artery. So there's an artery that goes to your, this part of your chest and I'll dissect that off. So you now have an artery sort of swinging in space in your hand. And you take that artery, which is coming from the chest down here, and you plug it in to the coronary vessel. And you plug it in downstream from the critical stenosis. Don't want to plug it in upstream, right? Because all you'll do is put more blood where you can't get through. So you go downstream, and then that perfuses uh, the heart. And this is very successful, this surgery. Um, it relieves symptoms. People seem to live longer. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a good surgery. The alternative is to take a vein graft. So you take a vein from somewhere else in the body, and you attach it at both ends. You attach one end to the aorta, so you put, make a little nick in the aorta and attach the vein graft to there so that float blood can come through the vein graft from the aorta. And then you plug in the distal end into the coronary vessel. And this is called an anastomosis here. So surgeons become very good at making a little cut, putting the vessel down, and sewing it on such that the flow is, is good. Right? And so cardiac surgeons, you know, the cabbage surgery is, was a huge thing in cardiac surgery. I don't know, a million a year or something are done. Uh, surgeons become exceptionally good at this operation. Like some of them can do six a day, ten a day, uh, because they set the patient up, and then the surgeon comes in, the 
for the final like anastomosis and gets that part right. right? And all of the other stuff has been done, sort of to get it set up. So these, you know, when somebody goes in for a triple bypass surgery, you have three of these things plugged into very cor various coronaries, etc. Very successful. Uh, imaging can be used post surgical recovery to make sure that the graft itself is open and blood flow is going through it and that the anastomosis is fine and everything's in, in good shape. The vein grafts unfortunately don't last as long as the lima artery. The artery will last pretty well forever. It's under the correct pressure, it's under the correct flows. The vein graft itself will start to break down after a decade or so. You'll start getting aneurysms and it will block off and things like that. So it's not as um, hardy as the, the Lima uh, stenosis. Okay, going back to um, imaging and trying to decide who should get either cabbage or uh, a stent, you have to uh, understand whether or not the flow has been reduced through that lesion. Ideally, if you see a lesion on the x-ray or you see a lesion on CT, uh, you'd like to know if, if, you're, if the stenosis is called a critical stenosis, and that means that blood flow will drop down under stress. And a number of perfusion uh, imaging techniques are available, and we'll study those. Uh, this set of images is from MR perfusion, uh, where uh, a contrast agent is injected into the vein of the patient and you take subsequent MR pictures over time. And you measure the signal intensity in a region of interest in the heart. And you can plot that signal intensity as a function of time and figure out what the flow is to that region of tissue, right? So the imaging brightness in, in magnetic resonance with these contrast agents, and you use what's called T1 weighted imaging, the imaging brightness goes up if there's more contrast there. So if the contrast flows into tissue, the, the signal intensity will go up. This, so to analyze what the flow is, you can look at the slope of the increase of signal over time, uh, you can look time to peak. How long does it take for the signal to peak? Uh, so there's a, a set of analyses uh, uh, methods used to actually measure the, the flow. And ideally, you would like to know the flow in you know basically milliliters per minute, or you know milliliters per gram per minute uh, in in the tissue. <coughs> The interesting thing about the heart is if you exercise, so at rest, your baseline flow is about one mil per gram per minute, right? That, that flows through a, a chunk of tissue in your heart, right? So the, the amount of blood that's passing through that chunk of tissue is about one mil per gram per minute, right? When you exercise, it goes up to about five, right? So it's a five X increase in flow. And that's why when you exercise, if it only goes up to two, because you, you have a stenosis, then you, you feel it, right? The tissue is not getting the oxygen that it is demanding. That's called ischemia. A perfusion deficit can also be seen on CT scans. So these are a, a set of CT scans at different positions in the heart from the base up towards the valve plane down towards the pointy bit, the apex of the heart. And you can see that the contrast agent has gone into most of the myocardium in the, in the short axis image here, but there is a segment in which the contrast agent does not seem to have flowed in there, right? And so that's just a perfusion deficit. You can measure that in a single time frame if you're confident that you're at the right time after injection just with one time frame, one image, you can see a perfusion deficit. And the reason this is significant is because not, even though a lesion can have the same geometry, so in a coronary, you may reduce 
the diameter of the coronary by say 75 percent right so we're down to 25 percent diameter in the coronary artery and you can see that on the x-ray angio we see it on the ct in patient one that will be a significant stenosis in the when you stress the patient they'll have a critical drop in flow in patient two it isn't significant and so it's exactly the same geometry of stenosis. However, in the second patient, for whatever reason, usually because they have some other source of flow to the region that that vessel is going to, so it's collateral flow, for example. So you stress that patient, and they don't have ischemia, right? And so you want to treat the first person who has the ischemia. It isn't necessarily a good idea to treat the second person with a stent or a bypass because they don't get ischemia, right? And so that this uh, direct evidence in imaging of ischemia, which is a lack of blood flow, is important to determine who should get the, the therapy. And you, you can look at a, a dynamic set of these measurements. So this is actually 25 sequential images of a human heart and I think probably everybody can see here that there is likely an area of ischemia right so here's the short axis of the heart this is the right ventricle the left ventricle free wall lat called the lateral wall of the heart this is the base like this is the diaphragm right here and that's the liver the contrast, when it goes in your vein, it first goes to the right side, to, into your right ventricle. So that brightens up first, and then, you know, about six heartbeats later, the left ventricle gets bright after the blood has come from the lungs into the left ventricle. And then it goes out of the left ventricle into the aorta. Once it's in the aorta, it can go down the coronaries into the myocardium. And so that's what is causing the brightness of this myocardium. See how it gets brighter with time? And you would say probably that's ischemic, right? There seems to be a dark spot there. Everybody agree? Right? You know, this is, this is the thing about medical imaging. When you look at data and you make that decision, your sensitivity is if this person is positive, how many times, you know, what's my fraction of calling a positive correct, right? So if I call everybody positive, I, I have huge sensitivity, right? Get 100% of the people. But I fold in people who this actually isn't positive. It's an artifact or something, some imaging artifact. So it's kind of, you, you learn how to, how to read these. Most, most of this is done by human readers, and they just look at it and make an intelligent guess. They are an AI machine, right? They've, they've seen enough cases to, to make a really good guess. And you can average a bunch of slices together. So this, this one is a one millimeter section of the heart. It's a very thin section, right? And so the signal to noise at each point is not great. As you can see, there's a lot of hashy noise on this thing causing this dark stuff to kind of come and go, right, as time goes on. So it's, you're uncertain how that's going. So one way of increasing the signal to noise, that is the signal power, which should be the same average value divided by the random fluctuations, which on here you can see is this noise, is to average six of those together. So just stack six slices on top of each other, average them together. Now you have a bigger volume, right? So it's, and if you're looking at perfusion, it probably doesn't matter that it's six millimeter slice. That's still a reasonable resolution, right? So here it starts to look a little better in terms of signal to noise. The amount of fluctuation has gone down, right? And so in, in imaging, you have image quality, which we'll look at, which is your basic noise level or signal to noise. And then you have to look at the task that you're trying to accomplish. And in this case, we're trying to accomplish 
the task of detecting a region that has low flow. Right? And I think this that resolution is probably fine for this task. Right? So here's a one millimeter slice in the long axis, same patient. Right? What we were looking at before as the low flow region is this thing that seems to be sort of blinking on and off as to whether or not it's a low flow region. Then we average those to six millimeters. Yeah, it's still it's it's more convincing now, right? You're getting dark ones, but every once in a while it, the, the, it pops in a bright frame, right? So there, there's some uncertainty there. And so part of imaging physics, imaging engineering is how do I take this technique and stop this blinking? of this, you know, perfusion deficit. How do I make it just look like a perfusion deficit? Like there is one there probably, right? But it's blinking on and off, right? And so this is, the uncertainty is from the, the imaging technique itself. So sometimes it's absolutely clear that there's a, a perfusion deficit just by the difference in the signal intensity from here to here. So this is normal myocardium or maybe normal-ish, and then this is really, you know, heavily um, uh, stenosed vessel causing a, a really dark spot, so there isn't any perfusion in this part. And so that's CT, and then these images are single photon emission computed tomography, or SPECT. And what's the first thing you notice about SPECT images, other than the fact they're in color? They are really blurry, right? So the spatial resolution is super low, right? It's, it's a, a, a blurrogram. And however, given it's a blurrogram, you still see there's a major chunk of tissue that's missing signal here. You expect a donut here. You don't expect a horseshoe, right? And so given that, you would, you would detect this 100% of the time and say that's a perfusion deficit. Okay, any, any question about stenosis and perfusion deficit, any, anything like that? Yeah? Uh, so under cabbage, uh, you said uh, we take the uh, artery and we plug it in downstream uh, below the stenosis. Yes. Uh, so by doing that, do we kind of leave the tissue around the stenosis? Does that kind of uh, deteriorate uh, that, that we are bypassing? Yeah. That's a really good question. I'm going to repeat the question so that it goes on the recording. Um, so the question is, if you plug in a cabbage vessel distal to the stenosis, so you perfuse everything downstream from that, what happens upstream? Have you abandoned upstream? And you have abandoned the vessel in the region of the lesion. Upstream from that, the vessel's okay. So if there's, a, if there's a branch coming off upstream from that, should be okay, right? But granted, if you don't treat that lesion, you've got a problem right there. If there's a branch coming off where the lesion is, now you have a problem, right? And so you might just say goodbye to that branch, which is possible, and you can do that sometimes. Or you can do heroic things like, do kissing stents where you put one stent through the lesion and they're side by side and the other stent goes down the branch. Right? And so that, that's done as well. It's a good question. Yeah? Um, are stents like usually considered invasive? That's a great question. So are stents invasive? I would say they are invasive, but they're minimally invasive in the sense that you don't have to crack the chest to put them in. So because you can get a stent into the vessel through arterial access, you just put a catheter and a guide wire and everything up into the, the patient's vascular system, it's truly minimally invasive, right? You just put it up there, blow it in, come out, and basically you, you hold you know, a, a piece of cloth on your femoral artery for 20 minutes and then you're done. Right? You have to take some drugs afterwards, so anticoagulant drugs, but otherwise it's, it's a really minimally invasive procedure. 
which is great. You're walking around the next day. Yep. Right, so do they always crack the checks? Do they sometimes do like, like a single port like your body? That, that's a really good question. Do you have to crack the chest to do cabbage? The answer is no. And um, a number of systems have been developed where you make ports through the ribs. Uh, so you go between the ribs in a small hole and you have essentially chopsticks or some kind of instruments that go into the chest and you try and stabilize the heart uh, while, you're, while you're doing this and, and do your anastomosis. Um, and that, you know, is, is done. Uh, there's a, a company called um, uh, Intuitive Surgical and their robotic system was built to do cardiac surgery. It doesn't do cardiac surgery very often. It mostly does prostates now, but um, it, it was built for that. The, the irony of the whole thing is it might actually be more painful to recover from having three holes between your uh, ribs than having your chest cracked and put back together. Which is, you know, because it just, it's really painful. Rib, rib injuries are super painful, right? Whereas if you just like crack the sternum like this, your ribs are all intact and everything. They, they just wire them back together. Any other questions? These are all good questions. Good. Okay, so a, another major form of heart disease that we need to image and figure out how severe the disease is, is uh, looking at the heart valves themselves and principally the ones that are of most concern are the aortic valve and the mitral valve because they cause the greatest morbidity if, if they go wrong. Uh, but also the tricuspid and the pul pulmonic valve um, can, can uh, be replaced uh, and fixed if, if they're not in good working shape. So uh, just as a review, we looked at this before. It, this is the valve plane. Uh, we have the aortic valve in the middle here with the coronaries coming off. So you have to keep that in mind when you're repairing this valve. You have, you know, the origin of the coronary arteries. You don't want to forget about that uh, when you fix the valve. Uh, pulmonic valve up here and then uh, basically the tricuspid and the mitral valve. The mitral valve has a really interesting structure. It's sort of this smile, half smile here, and it's the shape of the annulus here is kind of a horse or saddle shape. Uh, so it's, it's uh, difficult to model. You can't just model it as a flat plane. Um, and so this, uh, uh, you know, when you're building prosthesis and things like that, it's, it's a difficult valve to deal with. This one's a lot simpler. Um, and I, I don't think I have any Taver pictures here. I've, I'll show them next week, I guess, or on Thursday. So what happens to aortic valves, oftentimes as you age, you'll get um, a, a stiffening of the leaflets uh, and they, they just can't move as well as they could when you're young and flexible, right? And oftentimes you'll see that there's uh, calcifications growing on the leaflets and those calcifications get in the way of the normal function and eventually you basically just have to take the whole thing out and put a new one in. Luckily, uh, aortic valve surgery, uh, which is called SAVR, um, is tremendously successful. So basically you crack the chest, you cut open the root of the aorta, and you sew in a new valve. Right? And these valves are usually made of, you know, they can be made of pig valves um, or mechanical valves. And it's, it's tremendously successful. So here's an example of a nice, fresh, you know, 18-year-old uh, aortic valve. When it's closed, you know, all the leaflets are nice and co-opted so that blood cannot backflow back in you know, to the left ventricle from the aorta. And then when it's open, it, it goes wide open. The, the soft valve leaflets just open wide and whew, the blood goes out quite easily. In someone who's uh, in their 70s, you often see a disease valve that looks like this. It can't coapt entirely so that it, when the valve leaflets come together, there might be a little gap between them. And so 
blood can actually go the wrong way through the valve with a little jet. And then when the left ventricle contracts, the pressure can only move the valve so far and then they stop. And so you have a small hole. That's called aortic valve stenosis. And it will cause a high velocity pressure jet of blood to come through uh, your aortic valve. And you can see that on MR, you can see it on echo, you can hear it with a stethoscope. Right? And under those conditions, when you have this situation where it can't open, the, usually what happens is the left ventricle, for a little while anyway, becomes like a rower's left ventricle. It gets really beefy, so it gets muscular and it's contracting really hard because it has to generate a lot of pressure to keep the amount of blood flow constant, right? That's the thing your body needs, a certain amount of blood flow. It's pushing it through a smaller and smaller hole, so it needs higher and higher pressure to get it through there, and, and the heart gets really beefy. And, um, and then, eventually, after a year or so of that, it starts to fail. It just, the, it, the muscle starts to waste away, and it starts to dilate, and you get diastolic heart failure. So you want to get a new valve in before you start going down that failure pathway. Right? And so imaging is a great way to look at the heart and say, well, the aortic valve you know, has a certain amount of stenosis. It's probably good for another year. But after that, we should you know, get it out of there and give this heart a break. You can watch. A, this is a really nice video on uh, aortic valve disease. I'm not going to do it here. but. I uh, encourage you to watch it. It's, it's really well done. So aortic valve stenosis, um, review, openings too small, you get a high velocity jet, big pressure gradient between the, the left ventricle itself and what's in the aorta, and it eventually leads to LV failure. And patients who have this fairly typical, you know, symptoms, you know, they get angina, just like you get with coronary disease. Uh, they feel faint uh, and uh, shortness of breath, etc. cetera. Okay. So this is dynamic CT of a patient who has uh, a really stenotic aortic valve. So you can see that there's calcium in there. The bright signal is calcium. The uh, CT number, the Hounsfield unit of calcium, is quite high because it attenuates a lot of x-rays. The calcium does. And so if you've got that on your valve, it'll show up as this bright signal. And you can see that the valve really isn't opening. You know, we should see those flaps like go up as the left ventricle is ejecting. So it's ejecting blood through a very small orifice here that's you know, it's not even visible. And then if you freeze frame that uh, left ventricle at one phase, so let's say end systole, so this is when the, just as the left ventricle has ejected all of its blood and we should see that the aortic valve is open and stuff's going through, uh, as we pan through that valve, so here we're looking at it from a long axis view, and this blue line here represents the orientation of these pictures, you can see that that valve is not really wide open. It's a, maybe the area is about 25% or something what it should be. Okay, and so you can evaluate that actually. You can just me do planimetry and measure like what that valve area is. And then there are guidelines to decide after a certain valve area we should replace the valve. Okay. So the, the pictures you get if everything goes well are, are wonderful in terms of figuring out who should get a new valve. Mitral valve disease, uh, now this is a valve that stops the blood from going back to the lungs. Okay? When your left ventricle uh, contracts, this valve shuts and that stops the blood going back to the lungs because you want the blood to go out the aorta. Right? And, um, and so this is an interesting valve in that it has uh, these cordae tendini, which uh, essentially adhere, they're, they're like strings, and they're attached to the valve leaflets, and then they go down to a, a section of longitudinal muscle, 
that is kind of implanted or grows out of the endocardial wall of the heart. So it's like it's like kite strings, right? And so as as the the valve has pressure on it, those strings help keep it it closed, right? And because the left ventricle generates a lot of pressure, right? So you it's hard to hold that valve shut. In its normal condition, you've got a nice sort of length here. These muscles contract a bit to hold it, you know, uh, closed. And you have a, live, a lovely line here where the valve is co-opted. And, you know, the, the leaflets come down like this so that positive pressure keeps them closed together. And everything's working just wonderfully. Um, <clears throat> this is the first heart sound. So when you hear lub-dub at uh, lub, is when your left ventricle contracts and the pressure goes up high enough to shut this valve. That's where you hear that th th lub. And then the dub is basically when the aortic valve shuts. Right? So if you have a um, uh, prolapse of this valve, so if this leaflet, so if there's some reason that it's extended its shape or the geometry of the ventricle has pulled it off this way, you'll leave a gap here and blood will shoot back up through. You won't get all of the blood going up the aorta, so your cardiac output goes down. Your heart has to work harder to keep your cardiac output normal. Right? You will notice if your cardiac output goes down, your heart starts working harder, and then you're OK again. You don't feel faint and things like that. Um, degenerative mitral valve uh, disease, uh, you know, if some of these Cordae tendini get uh, broken for whatever reason, then you, you can have a leaflet that's called flailing. And when you look at it on echo, the, the leaflet actually goes in the wrong direction. It just pops up like that and, and flaps in the breeze. And, uh, and then functional mitral regurgitation is when the coaptation of the leaflets doesn't occur 100%, normally because you've had some kind of ischemic event and your ventricle has, has changed its shape because a, bunch of, or a lot of the tissue in your ventricle might be dead. So if you have a big infarct, the ventricle expands, pulls everything out, and now the mitral valve cannot coapt anymore. And there, like what, who can guess how you would try and fix that? If you were just sitting there and say, hmm, we got to fix that. How, I'm going to invent a new technology. How do I fix that? So the valve's like this, right? It's got a three millimeter gap or something. Take a guess. Just... So I could, you could ream out that, that valve and put a new one in. That's a simple one, right? What else? But say everything, say this stuff is still reasonably in reasonable good shape. Yep, you could graft, just graft something here such that it has enough distance to, to co-apt, right? That's one way, just sew it on there. Yeah? Absolutely, and so when you just need them to get closer together, right? And so, this, so their suggestion was, why don't we pinch these together somehow? And there's a couple of ways of doing that. There's... Basically, a big cardiac vein runs out here. You can put like a clip in there, a paper clippy kind of thing, and just, rah, just pinch it together, right? And so the whole thing comes, you know, together. Uh, and inside, you can just clip them together, right? And so it's it's quite interesting. You just put a clip right across here. It's called a mitral clip. Just with a with a catheter, you go up there and go clip them together. Take a look at the mitral regurg, how much is happening. Go, yeah, it's still a bit. Put another clip, cook. And then look and say, oh, that's better. Get out of there. And actually, it helps people a lot. Right? And it's a trivial thing, right? It's like so obvious. It's like, why don't I just put a clip? Right? It's called a mitral clip. And there's a big trial that just came out uh, four months ago showing that the mitral clip actually really does help. Uh, people uh, reduce symptoms. So in MR imaging, uh, one of the interesting things about MR is the blood signal itself 
you know, gives you this uh, brightness. This, and if the the um, blood itself is is swirling around in kind of a, a fast and random way, that signal will get reduced because it gets dephased. It's called. And we'll take a look at that. But what the net effect is, if you have mitral regurgitation on a Cine MR, when you when you're playing it, you'll see this black jet. And that's, that's the jet of the blood coming the wrong way. It's supposed to be going out here, out the aorta, and it's coming back into the atrium. And you, you can find some really great movies of uh, regurgitant jets uh, online. In fact, is that a movie? No, that's not a movie. Let me... None of these are movies. Okay. So here's another uh, example of looking at the geometry of the mitral valve um, when it's closed, showing that it's having uh, problems uh, co-opting. And so this is a kind of a tenting geometry, this height here. It should just be a flat uh, structure when you, when you visualize it in the picture. And so you can measure this uh, bowing as a as a measure of how much prolapse you've got uh, and then one leaf might be prolapsed or the other this is posterior leaf this is anterior leaf and that's what they're supposed to look like on MR when they're normal and so it's MR is a very sensitive technique for this echo is pretty good at this CT is good at this they're all good at it um, and here's a really interesting uh, mechanical uh, valve uh, that's used uh, to close that. Um, and you can hear this valve going click clack, click clack, click clack when you when you put a stethoscope on. Um, these aren't aren't used all well, I don't know. I'm not gonna say anything. I don't I don't know how often mechanical valves are used versus uh, bioprosthetic valves based on animal tissues and things like that. Great thing about this is that's gonna last forever, right? That's not gonna wear out. You're going to wear out a long time before this wears out. Problem is, it might grow stuff on it, like grow, you know, some clot or some other vegetation on it. Okay, great. So now we can move to image quality. So we'll take a quick question break. Any any questions about that stuff? So really, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't happen. I guess their um, the valve material itself doesn't seem to generate a big immune response, and I, I don't know how. That's a great question. I can't answer it right now, but uh, I'll look it up. Like how they got around that, because I don't think you have to. It's not like getting a transplant. You don't go on a, a course of drugs, you know, to eliminate a host graft kind of thing. Um, you know, I don't know. Anybody know? No. Okay, we'll, we'll look it up for next week. Okay, all right, so we're going to now move to image quality. And this is lecture three. Okay. And uh, I, I sent out an email um, pointing out that the book chapter was there, where it, most of this is coming from the chapter four of that Bushberg. Uh, book. Uh, so if you don't understand what I'm saying, I would recommend you go read that book first uh, mm -hmm. about this topic because most of these figures are straight out of that chapter. Right? And so you can read the, the concept right there. Um, and then if you still don't understand it, just come to you know office hours and we'll figure it out. Okay? So an imaging system, you know, there are a couple of fundamental things you can measure to decide on whether or not the image is high quality or not. Okay. Um, fundamentally, if the image has enough quality such that you can always make the correct call, you're kind of done. right? So if the correct call is, can I detect cancer in this person's liver or in you know, a human's liver, and you have some imaging that people look at it and they go, 
man, that's such low resolution and crappy signal to noise, but you always get the call right, then it doesn't matter, right? So there's trade-offs between making the image pretty and getting the call right. That's, at the end of the day, it really depends on what your task is, right? for what image quality means. Right? So if you look at, for example, those spec images, and you say, man, the, the full width at half max of those images is like, a centimeter. How the hell am I going to use a picture with a centimeter full width at half max? Well, if it's perfusion and it's really sensitive, then maybe it's okay. Yeah. But we'll look at a couple of quantitative techniques for figuring out just what is the spatial resolution of an imaging system. Right? And um, when you guys, you guys, most of you have experience with imaging systems through your cameras, right? And your phones and you pay more each time the array size of that camera increases, right? So, you know, when I first got one of those phones, it was like, I don't know, 640 by 480 was the array size of the camera inside the phone, right? It was a tiny set of pixels. And so you didn't need super high resolution optics to put a picture on that, on that array, right? Now, these arrays they, in the phones are enormous, right? They're, I don't know, 2K by 2K, or I don't know. Does anyone know what their phone has in it? Who knows how many megapixels their phone has? By 2K. Say that again. It's like 4,000 by 3K. So now it's 4K by 3K. So it's a 12 megapixel camera. That's what it is. OK. That's a lot of pixels, right? When, you, when you're looking at medical images, it's very rare to get more than 512 by 512 in a medical image. Um, now, if you have a digital x-ray and it's a large field of view, it can, it can go up. But So the question is, with that huge array, if you took a picture of a, you know, a blank wall and there was a dot on the wall, right, how big would the dot have to be to say there's a dot on the wall? Right? If it's a 5 micron dot, you probably aren't going to see it with your 12 megapixel camera. But if it's a 1 millimeter dot, you know, at a distance of a meter, you're going to see that dot. Right? And so that's sort of the, the idea of what is my, my resolution of detection of an object or a really small object. And one thing, one way to characterize how your imaging system um, images, very small things, is to say, what is the point spread function of the imaging system? If I put a dot in there and I look at the picture, what does the picture look like? Is it a single pixel or is it a, a spread over a, a bunch of pixels? Right? And so this, if we say in a CT scanner, a classic way of measuring this on a CT scanner is you put a tiny tungsten or gold bead into the system. And it's so small that it's smaller than an imaging voxel. So imaging voxels on CT scanners are about a half millimeter by a half millimeter by a half millimeter, somewhere in that range, right? It's very small. But let's, let's put a gold bead in there that is a tenth of a millimeter diameter. Okay, So it actually should sit inside one imaging pixel or one imaging box, that, that object. I stick it in the scanner and I image. The picture I get out ideally should look like this. There should be a pixel where that image exists or where that object exists that's brighter than all its surrounding pixels. Right? What you will see on most imaging systems is something like this which is a Gaussian or some kind of centrally weighted blob that is your imaging system's rendering of that tiny object. And that's called the point spread function, right, in two dimensions. And to measure the point spread function, you want to have pixel dimensions that are small enough to actually illuminate what the imaging system is doing to that small object. If I'm trying to measure a point spread function, and instead of these little squares is my pixel, I have a pixel that's the size of this entire 
array here, that's not going to illuminate what my spatial resolution looks like, right? I need a pixel representation of the object such that I can see that. And they, you know, we do this in CT scanners. You, there's a phantom that you put in the scanner and then it's got a little tiny bead in it and you look at the picture of the bead and see, you know, what, how it spreads out. It's called the point spread function. You can also look at a line spread function uh, and an edge response. And so they're, they're variations on the point spread function. So if we, if we draw, here's the point spread function. It's a two-dimensional function. Uh, so as I move from the center of the dot that I'm imaging away, it, it falls away in two dimensions. Line spread function, I put, say, a tungsten wire in the scanner. And then as you cross the wire in your image, so you get a picture that's a, that's a very bright line. And as you cross the line, that's called the line spread function. And then you can also measure the edge. And that is if I have nothing and then a very sharp edge with, say, metal or something like that, how does the, the image fall away from that edge? That's the edge response function. Most of the time, we'll be talking about this, the point spread function. And in uh, all of these imaging techniques, we really should think about it in three dimensions. So if I have a, a dot in my scanner, whether it's an MR scanner or a CT scanner, you know, I have fall off of signal in, in three dimensions. So you can trade off, and this is often done in scanning. In fact, it's always done. Um, you can trade off resolution for signal to noise. And if our original signal across our image, so here is our pixels in the image. Uh, if the original signal sort of has this variation as I'm going across the picture, that variation can come from either the object varying or random noise that is, you know, accumulated as we're making the picture. Right? And in CT, that random noise is from usually the uncertainty of the number of photons that were detected by each detector in your detector array. In your hand camera, in your 12 megapixel camera, when you get to low light conditions and you take a shot, it's just the number of photons that actually hit you know, each detector in your 12 me megapixel array. And that will vary in low light conditions such that you get sort of a noisy, noisy picture. Um, interesting fact. So when you're looking at, at very dim things with your eyes, right? So your eyes are like, you know, a, a really good imaging detector. Um, so a really dim thing is, is in the night sky, if you look at a star and the star is there and then it's not, and then it's there and then it's not, etc. So it's like right at the, at the limit of your detectability, right? For brightness. Venus, always there, right? Enough photons are hitting your eye that, you know, it's always there. Some other star, I mean, Cygnus or something, you look at it and they come and go. So how many photons do you think are hitting your eye to make a detection event? So you go, dunk, oh yeah, there, there it is. How many photons do you think that takes? Uh, somebody's got to make one guess. Yeah. It is 10. That's a very good guess. My guess would have been like, I don't know, 10,000, something like that. It's about 10, right? Which to me is freaking remarkable. But I, I, don't, I guess it's not remarkable to you. But it's uh, the fact that you're generating an a excitation profile in a cell with like, or a group of cells with 10 photons. And so that's the dynamic range of your vision. And it's obviously logarithmic, right? As you turn lights on, it goes up in factors of 
So when you're in a noisy regime, one way of making things smoother is to average them together. And so if we're trying to figure out what this underlying function is, maybe it's just slope like this, and this is the noise, we can just average these noisy values together, say every one, two, three, four, five, we'll just take the mean value of all five, and we'll stick that at that point, right in the middle of that point. And that's, that's just called an averaging kernel. It just runs across, it blurs the picture, uh, but it causes a, um, you know, increase essentially in the signal to noise. And these are various kernels that you can use uh, to average neighboring pixels uh, depending on how aggressively you'd like to average them. They're starting with just a rectangle, right, where you average all of these equally versus uh, something that's centrally weighted uh, versus something that actually would enhance edges because it has negative stuff on, on the outside. here. And so these kernels used to increase signal to noise or actually enhance uh, edges. You know, here's a dictionary of a whole set of kernels. This one, which is just a centrally weighted average, basically passes a Gaussian filter across your picture and makes it smoother. So when you're in Photoshop or on your camera, you know, when you say improve quality, oftentimes what it does is it smooths the picture. And it just passes a Gaussian across the picture whoop, to try and tamp down the noise. And this is always done in CT. Most of the time it's done in MR, uh, this type of averaging. And then kernels like this that have a difference will actually enhance a derivative, right, or a slope. And then it can go to higher derivatives. So here, Let's take a look at, at the effect of averaging or multiplying by these uh, kernels that increase edges. Here's our original x-ray of a knee. If we pass a, a Gaussian kernel across it, we just get a blurred picture of the knee, but it has reduced noise. And then as we go this way, increasing the amount of edge enhancement, we start getting really hard bright edges in the object until finally you can create an object that is essentially just the edges right, in, in the picture. And so this is, um, off, these convolution kernels are often used to tune up the, the appearance of the picture. If the clinician doesn't like a noisy picture, oftentimes you average. And then sometimes you combine these things together to try and retain edge information while averaging. And that's often done in CT. So looking at image quality, it's good to understand what um, Fourier components are uh, in any signal. So if I have position in space in millimeters across here and uh, amplitude of my signal on the y-axis here, and I have a sine wave a primary sine wave here that has essentially two cycles across this field of view. Oops, sorry. All right. And then secondary sine waves that have then four cycles, then six cycles, then eight cycles across the field of view. When I add up all of these sine waves together, I get this signal here, right, which is a square wave. And if I added up an infinite number of sine waves with smaller and smaller wavelengths with the right coefficients, I would absolutely create a square wave. Right? So this is a simple forward example of what Fourier decomposition is. This is Fourier composition. So we've started with a predetermined set of weightings for sine waves, added them together, and we're going to eventually generate this square wave, right? With the one, two, three, four terms that I've used here, we've got a reasonable representation of a square wave, but it does have this ringing on the top of it, right? So there's a little oscillation on the top of it. As we add higher and higher harmonics, the, that ring gets 
farther and farther down. So this is a way of, of looking at what frequencies, what spatial frequencies are represented in the pictures that your imaging system generates. So if we take a, an image of an object that looks like this. So this is essentially a rectangle function, right, with a specific fundamental frequency. You know, and it's the, this type of phantom is often called a line pair phantom. And so you've got basically a set of signals, in this case rectangle, that you're just going to push things closer and closer and closer together. And so <clears throat> the frequency of this signal, it's a square wave with this frequency, is one cycle per millimeter. Right? This guy here is a frequency of two cycles per millimeter. And this one down here is four cycles per millimeter. Right? And then when we image that object with our imaging system, we can look at the appearance of the object to determine what spatial frequencies are transmitted by our imaging system? What can it pick up? Right? And so this is a blurred version of this. And the reason it's blurred is because our imaging system, whether it be MR or CT or SPECT or whatever, makes a blurred version of this. Right? It adds blurring. And eventually, so we, we can look at the contrast, the signal amplitude, as it were, of the low frequency and the contrast at the higher frequencies to determine how you know, the, the signal is falling off as a function of spatial frequency. So here you can see this imaging system does a fine job of creating what's essentially a sine wave at this frequency. But by the time we get up to this spatial frequency, it doesn't create any signal, right? It's, it's gone, right? It's just a DC shift, right? So there's no oscillation left in that signal. It's just, it's just whatever the average is, right? And this is when you plot those amplitudes or loss of amplitude of signal as a function of higher and higher frequency, that's called the modulation transfer function. Okay. And so going back to our picture, we're gonna plot, we're gonna plot through here the signal amplitude and we get it, measure it here, and then we'll plot through here the signal amplitude, we get it, plot through here the signal amplitude and it's falling off as the frequency goes up. And we just plot those points on a curve, spatial frequency in cycles per millimeter, relative amplitude compared to low frequency signals. And then as it falls away, that's called our modulation transfer function. Okay. And it's in spatial frequency space. So is that pretty clear? What's going on there? OK, good. Um, it turns out that the Fourier transform of a modulation transfer function, can anybody guess what it is? It's the point spread function. So remember, we go back here to this thing. If I take a delta function and image it, I get this, which is Intensity is a function of position, right? If I take the Fourier transform of that point spread function, or vice versa, I get this function, the modulation transfer function. And that's the representation of the spatial resolution of your imaging system in Fourier space, as opposed to in space space. So one of the things you could do for a project, if people are interested, is take a look, like design phantoms, we can have them printed, um, and you design phantoms to test spatial resolution of a particular imaging system. 
whether it be MR, CT, something like that. And we could take your phantom and take, go to a CT scanner, for example, scan it with different acquisition techniques to determine how those techniques change the modulation transfer function right, of the pictures. This is uh, a CATFAN 500 phantom that you stick in your CT scanner if you want to analyze the spatial resolution of that scanner. Not all scanners are created equally, right? They, some have higher resolution than others. And there's a number of factors which affect the resolution. And so <clears throat> when, you, when you take a look at this picture and you zoom up, you can see how the amplitude of the oscillation fades away as those line pairs get closer and closer together. So you can just directly measure the modulation transfer function on the scanner. And uh, other phantoms have been created to do the same thing, a line pair, which is like the phantom we just looked at. Or if you want a, a simpler, self-contained thing, you can take a, a phantom like this and just see if for your imaging system, where, where does this disappear, right? So eventually these come close enough together you just can't see that they're lines anymore. And so you draw that angle and say, that's, that's my resolution that I can see. For uh, CT, often what is used is a contrast detail curve. And um, what we're looking at here is the effect of increasing image noise or loss in signal to noise ratio on the ability to detect small objects. So here we have high signal to noise. So if we measure the signal in this part, you know, inside the phantom, and we measure the signal in the background, we get a signal difference, and then measure the random fluctuations of the signal in the background. We can divide it by that, and you have a contrast to noise ratio. As contrast to noise ratio drops because the noise is being amplified here. You can see that some of these smaller objects basically just disappear. Statistically, inside a disk that size, you statistically just will not observe a mean value that's higher than the background, right, every time. And so, this, this basically shows you what size of objects you can observe as the noise is being increased. So your eye is able to sort of average over a larger space. Math is able to average over a larger space, so you just see that mean value up higher, right? Whereas if you don't have enough points down here, you, you're just not going to see Everyone got that? Okay, so this is another phantom that's, you can, with CT scanners, you just get a phantom like this, stick it in, and you change your acquisition to get the contrast detail you want. Yeah, for CT, what makes the noise go down is when you crank the photons up, just like your camera. More photons, basically you have a better estimate of the number of photons detected, and so the, the random noise goes down. In MR, it's, it's slightly more complicated. Um, depends on the proximity of the signal to the coil, and it depends on the pulse sequence you're using, and the T1 and T2 values of the tissue, etc. We can We'll look at that. So normally, when we're looking at image quality, and trying to characterize how much noise is in the image, you'll put a region of interest over some constant area, whether it be the background or some constant area, say in the heart, and you'll measure the standard deviation of the signal amplitudes of all the pixels you've, you've enclosed in your area or region of interest. And uh, so if we... Um, have two objects with, uh, let's say, you know, I don't know, the, what do we have there? What's the frequency? So, you know, let's say we measure 100 points 
in a, in a circle. And in one group of 100 points, we have a mean value here. In the other group, we have a mean value here. That means their signal is different right, between those two groups. And this is the variation in the signal in the, in the first region of interest versus the second region of interest. So the sigma value is quite important. That's the noise part of the contrast to noise calculation. If I want to know the signal to noise of this object only, I would look at its mean value and divide that by the RMS of that Gaussian, the root mean square deviation, or sigma, and that gives you the signal to noise of that object right, inside that uh, region of interest. If I have a constant object and I put a circle down as my region of interest and I calculate these statistics. I get the mean and the standard deviation in that region of interest. Okay? And let's say that's the green curve. And then I expand my sample to twice the diameter, but it's still inside the constant object. What happens to that distribution, to this guy? If I just increase it. So now I have twice as many points in there. So does the mean change if it's a constant object? Nope, right? The mean value is going to be the mean value for that constant object. So the mean does not change. Does sigma or the standard deviation change if the statistics are the same over the whole object as I increase that region of interest? Nope. Right. So sigma is a property of the variability of the signals, just as the mean is a property of the height, of the average height of all those signals. As I increase that region of interest, the only thing that happens is my estimate of those parameters gets better. I can, I can estimate the true value of the mean better because I'm using more points, and I can estimate the true value of, of sigma better because I'm using more points. That's the only thing that really happens. Now, the problem is, eventually in an image, if it's an interesting image, stuff happens, right? And so you'll, you have different levels. And so if you make this thing bigger and bigger, such that it includes some change, then all of a sudden, sigma is no longer an estimate of the noise. It's an estimate of how much actual signal change is occurring. So you have to, when you're estimating the noise, you've got to put, put it in an, in an area that's relatively constant. Right? That's, that's the key. No, we won't do that one. Okay, so here's an example of measuring, uh, you know, contrast to noise ratio. I've got a background and I have objects. I'm trying to detect an object in the background. Right, that's my my task is is there an object there so no problem no problem no problem yeah maybe something of a problem there and in order to quantify what it means that it's no problem to detect this we measure the mean value inside this object and its standard deviation sigma we measure the mean value of the background upon which that object is sitting and its standard deviation and then we go back here so here's the bright circle, here's the background, and we calculate this difference in signal, the contrast, divided by that standard deviation. And that's the contrast to noise. Okay. You can you have if if there's a circle here and say you have a thousand instances of a circle on a background and you ask somebody to sit in front of the screen and push a button when there's a circle there and push a button when there's or and not push a button if there's not right so it's a detection task right? in order to be right like a hundred percent of the time the contrast to noise should be around five okay so once once you're up around five or above it's really difficult to screw up for a human observer on a simple task like that. That's called the Rose Criterion. And once you're beyond five, 
Everything else is kind of gravy, right? If it's a simple detection task, right? I'm not saying all imaging is simple detection tasks, but if that's what you're doing, anything beyond five, you're, you're just kind of piling it on at that point. Right? However, do you think radiologists like to work at contrast to noise of five? Absolutely not. Right? They would like to work at 10, 20, you know, and then you're just looking at great pictures. Right? So, so uh, here's a signal to noise of 0.5, 1, and 2. Right? So it, it just shows you it's like pretty, like once you're up at 5, this thing is just like, bring jumps right out of that, yeah. And uh, so here's some other examples of signal-to-noise uh, ratios. Uh, oh, I have a demo. Okay, we got two minutes. How does this demo work? Let me see. So is there an object there is the question, right? And I, I kind of gave it away. Is there an object there? Where is the object there? Anybody see where you would put an object? That's where the object is, with a higher signal to noise. Right? And the thing that's changing, actually, in, in that area is not so much the mean, but also the statistics are changing of of the variance in the background. So it looks like that on the image quality. So it's pretty easy to tell with this signal to noise that there's an object there. Wait a minute. Okay. So you see an object there. Does anyone see an object? Nobody. Let's see if this is going to work. You see an object now? You do, right? So it's the same as the original object that was there, it just now it's moving. So it's, it's interesting, like human perception. Right? Two things are happening. One, it's moving. Two, you're getting many more instances of the object with random noise in the background. So your, your visual system is like integrating that up and creating a higher signal to noise representation of the object, right? And so that thing moving from the top left down is actually, I don't think the mean is any different. It's just the RMS is slightly less inside that box, right? And so you're, you're actually detecting a change in sigma as opposed to a change in the mean. Okay, so we've got one minute. We're gonna we're gonna quickly define these things. Okay. What is accuracy and precision? Um, this estimate, like if you have a if you have an uh, estimate with your imaging machine and it pulls up a cluster of values here and they're very very similar every time the precision of the system is high in the sense that it's you know the variability is low between shots but there's a bias in your estimate because this is the true value and so you basically you're not accurate but you always get the same answer or close to it and that's called high precision so you can fix that by doing some kind of calibration, right? Just shift that answer over. If you know what that calibration curve is, you can deal with it. This, every time you, you make your measurement, you might get the same mean value, right, for 10 measurements, but they're all over the shop. And so that's not precise. But it turns out your mean value is accurate. This is kind of the worst situation is that you're not precise, right? Your values are highly variable between shots, but you're also biased away from, from the true value. 
And so that's neither accurate nor precise. And then here is obviously highly accurate and highly precise. And so that's just a visual definition of, of those terms. And I think, yeah, let's just look at this real quick. This is five imaging centers were given, I believe, 150 stress echo cases to read. Okay. And they were told you must either call this patient normal or abnormal from this stress echo case. So they just handed them the stress echo cases and told them, go to town and read them. Center one produced 102 patients of, it thought were positive for ischemia. Center two got 62. Center three got 38. This is the same cases, same 150 cases. 71, 59. So you've got issues here, right? And a lot of it, you know, is uh, basically how aggressive is the reader? Are they willing to call it positive? These people obviously like calling them positive. Something must happen to those patients that are called positive that is good, <laughs> right? that's beneficial to them. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but there's some bias there, right? And so... We'll talk about how do you get rid of this bias when you're trying to evaluate an imaging technique, right? Because you've got all this noise on top of your thing. So how do you decide, oh, I've made my pictures better right when this happens? Okay, great. See you on Thursday.